This is from one of the review sheets or review questions uh, provided to you in the Blackboard course. We have uh, Joseph who's deposited $1,500 into an RRSP, that's a Registered Retirement Savings Plan, on February 1, 2009. So we've got $1,500 deposited on February 1, 2009, and he deposited another $1,000 on April 1, 2011. So another $1,000 goes into the account on April 1, 2011. The question says, what is the value of his account on February 1, 2012? In other words, how much is the account going to be worth on that date at the very end of the timeline? If the interest is 4.8% compounded quarterly from the period between February 1, to August 1, 2011, and you can see that I've got that period identified right here, so between that period, we're earning 4.8% compounded quarterly and then 3.25% compounded semi-annually between August 1, 2011 to February 1, 2012. First of all, let's get a couple of things out of the way. With a 4.8% compounded quarterly, that boils down to, that's a nominal rate that's compounded quarterly. The interest rate per quarter works out to be 1.2% per quarter. So that's 4.8 divided by 4, so 1.2% per quarter. Quarter. Um, the second uh, period has a, a different interest rate, 3.25% compounded um, semi-annually, and that boils down to an interest rate every six months of a, a rate of 1.625% per six-month period. So every six months they earn 1.625%. Now, what we need to do, you can see that this is going to be a two-step problem. What we need to do is step one, figure out how much money is in the account after uh, the uh, uh, completion of the 4.8% period, so up to the date of August 1. So we're going to need to add compound interest to that $1,000 and add compound interest to the $1,500. Find out what it's going to be worth on that date and then take that amount and then compound that for a secondary time period for the second interest rate at 3.25% compound assembly, so semi-annually. So we have to find out how many interest periods there are in each case. So uh, step one is going to be to, well, let's see. In step one, what we need to do is to count the number of periods between February 1, between February 1 and August 1. So we need to find out what n is equal to, how many interest periods there are for the first $1,500 investment. We also need to figure out the second number of interest periods for the second investment. So between February 1 to August 1, and remember that this is 09 to 11, we have a total of, well, let's see now, we have a total of two years, two years plus seven months. Now, how is the interest calculated? The interest is calculated quarterly, so it's per quarterly period. So in two years, we have a total of um, N is equal to eight quarterly periods plus, now how many quarterly periods are there in seven months? Well, remember that each quarter is a period, a length of three monthly periods. So seven months is going to be seven-thirds of a quarterly period, so seven-thirds seven quarters. And so what this means is that the, um, the uh, amount of a number of interest periods f between February 1 and August 1 is a total of, well, um, eight, eight plus seven-thirds amounts to ten and one-third quarterly periods. So ten and one-third quarterly periods. For the $10,000, the number of interest periods, of course, has to be calculated. And between April 1, and I'll work that out on the second page here, between April 1 of 11 to August 1 of the same year, we have a total of uh, four months. So this amounts to four months, and the question becomes, how many quarterly periods are there? Well, in this case, n is equal to four-thirds quarterly periods or one and one-third quarterly periods. That takes care of that time period. And now I'm going to go back and say, well, how many interest periods are there for the uh, final interest period where the interest rate changes to 3.25 percent? Well, from August 1, 2011 to February 1, 2012, August 1, 2011 to February 1, 2012, we have a total of six months exactly. And how is the interest computed? Well, for that time period, the interest is compounded 
in a semi-annual basis. So because it's compounded semi-annually, I have to ask myself the question, how many semi-annual periods there are? Well, six months is equal to exactly one semi-annual period. So now I have all the periods that I need, and I'm ready to go. I can now determine what the maturity value is. So step one is to find the maturity value, or find the final value, on the date of August 1, 2011. And how do we find that final value on August 1, 2011? Well, we simply add the compound amounts for each of the separate investments. So that final value is going to be $1,500 multiplied by the compound interest factor, 1 plus 0 0.012, 1 1.2 percent per quarterly period for 31 thirds. 31 thirds is the same as a 10 and 1 third. So 31 thirds is the exponent plus $1,000 multiplied by the compound interest factor of 1 plus 0 0.012 raised to the exponent 4 thirds. That's the exponent on the, uh, the, the number of interest periods that I have to compound the $1,000 for. This works out to an amount of $16.96.77 plus $1,016.03 or a total value, a grand total value of 27, 12, and 80 cents. And that's the value that is uh, um, the earned uh, accumulated value on the date of August 1, 2011. So step two now, we're ready for step two. Step two is to add compound interest to this for six more months or one more semi-annual period and how do we do that well step two is to say that final value is going to be that that uh, value on august the one which is twenty seven twelve and eighty cents multiplied by the compound interest factor at when the rate change has gone into effect one plus point zero one six two five per semi-annual period the exponent of positive 1 because it's only earning interest for exactly one more semi-annual period. And that final value works out to be a final value of 27.56 and 89 cents on February 1, 12.